A few days ago, I was visiting an antique shop, and as I was walking along, you know, minding my own business, just going about my day and enjoying lovely, you know, early spring sort of weather, well, something tragic happened. Something, something terrible happened. I felt a darkness slowly growing around me, a, a tightness winding in my chest as the air itself seemed to, to thicken all around. I knew the terrible, awful feeling far too well. Historical inaccuracy was afoot. Oh dear lord, send it to the fires! This is definitely among the worst portrayals I have ever seen of a British soldier from the late 18th century. Now, naturally, I eternally pity whoever would come across such a piece. At $20, this mug thing abomination cost. Did, did you know that for that much money, you could buy not just one, but two whole years of full membership to my most illustrious core of supporters on Patreon.com. And in doing so, of course, you get access to great patron-exclusive live streams uh, every two weeks, as well as week early access to all my videos like this one, alongside a slew of other benefits besides. Hey, maybe you already did know that. Anyways, enough beating around the bush. There is work to be done. So as ever, let us begin. <laughs> When I initially saw this man, I thought he was supposed to be a Napoleonic-era soldier. And actually, I was impressed at how not god-awful it was, uh, with that waist-high coat, the blue facings on his collar and cuffs, but none on the front buttons. Uh, but then I noticed the caption at its base. Red coat, it reads, with zero distinction as to rank or regiment, 1776. And that, my friends, is when I realized just how terrible this portrayal was, and that is what inspired the closer look. What I initially assumed to be a poorly drawn Shaco must in fact be an even worse shown bearskin cap. The iconic headgear of a grenadier of the British Army during this time, they were made of a black fur, though there were exceptionally rare instances of white fur being used as well, uh, and I did make a video on that topic a while, uh, a little while ago. Uh, a cloth backing, which usually featured a regimental badge or a symbol of some sort, and a front plate with a crest, which could also vary in color and design from regiment to regiment, in according to the regulations laid out by the Royal Clothing Warrant of 1768. I specify that because during the 18th century, a lot of military uniforms and the particular way in which men were dressed wasn't actually centralized by the military. There was a lot of leeway by regimental colonels in how they wanted to dress their regiment, their men. Uh, but some things, like coat and facing colors, were handed down directly from the king and needed to be abided by, again in this case by the royal clothing warrant. Now, unfortunately, instead of a well-detailed fur cap, this fellow is just wearing a congealed black blob on his head. Uh, the blob does not feature a plate at its front, but instead we see this strange, almost like Masonic-looking golden design? You can vaguely see here how they were initially kinda going for an angular look, kinda, sorta, almost like the real thing, but then I guess they just kinda gave up and, and decided to go crazy with it. Uh, I genuinely cannot say what that large large oval shape of gold is meant to be, at least not within an 18th century context. Uh, more likely, the creator looked to the cap badges on later Shakos, uh, or even, even later than that, Victorian developments, uh, where we do see on some select regiments a cap badge of sorts inlaid on their bearskins without the presence of any sort of crest on them. Uh, and that, of course, is not the only element of Napoleonic and Victorian uniform on this fellow, as we'll soon see. Moving further onwards, British soldiers did not wear lipstick. Next, let's look at this belting. Two leather cross belts colored white using pipe clay. That is precisely correct. Now, normally this man would carry his bayonet on his left side and his cartridge pouch on his right, but given the perspective here, I think we can forgive not being able to see either of those pieces. Uh, we do have a problem, though, sadly, when you look up to the top of the man's belting, where it sits loosely on his shoulders. 
A regimental coat ought to have strips of wool on its shoulders called epaulets, uh, which are attached on one side and buttoned down on the other, which the belt can then go through. Those epaulets, those strips of wool, are preventing the belts from riding up too highly on the man's shoulders and constricting his breathing, or, on the other hand, from sliding off of his shoulder on the other side. Epaulets, like many things, would also vary from regiment to regiment in their design, things like the lacing pattern and whatnot being different from group to group. Without any epaulets, however, this man is going to have to make sure to keep himself very well balanced, lest those belts should slip off, again to say nothing of it how it uh, might dig into his neck after only a little bit of moving around. Heaven protect him, of course, if he needs to uh, do something as, in, as insane in a military setting as uh, bend downwards just a tad. Oh, thankfully, soldiers never have to do anything like that. No, no, certainly not. Um, now, while we're looking at his shoulders, you'll also note how they do not have any wings on them. Indeed, if this man is meant to be a grenadier, as is implied by his cap, this would mean that his coat has a sort of white lacing on both shoulders. Both light infantrymen and grenadier coats would have wings. Um, they're one of multiple marks of distinction for men of the elite flank companies, so-called because every regiment during this time period had one company of each, one light infantry, one grenadier, and when standing on parade, the lights would be on the left of the formation and the grenadiers on the right. Instead, with these bare shoulders, this man seems to be wearing the coat of a battalion man, basically any regular old soldier who is not a part of the flank companies. Although it is possible that in fact this man is not meant to be a grenadier, but a fusilier. Because of course, at least for some regiments of fusiliers, uh, all of their enlisted men would wear bearskin caps and not cocked hats, at least, you know, formally. On campaign, a lot of times men would ditch the bearskins and replace them with cocked hats to sort of put the bearskins in storage because not only are they a lot more inconvenient uh, to wear and whatnot, they're a lot more uncomfortable, but of course they would also usually be the personal property of the regimental colonel and they are very, very valuable. So if you're going to go on campaign, well, leave those behind and just put on a regular old hat. Uh, but still, formally speaking, uh, regiments like the 23rd, the uh, Royal Welsh Fusiliers, uh, actually all of their enlisted men, not only the Grenadiers, would have bearskin caps. Uh, so it's possible that this man is a fusilier, not a grenadier, in which case not having wings on his coat is understandable. That's also reinforced by the idea that uh, if you look on his belting, he's not carrying a match case. Now, grenadiers during the American War of Independence would not actually be carrying grenades. That sort of thing really got, was gotten rid of in like the mid uh, 18th century, but all the same, oftentimes grenadiers would carry on their belting these brass uh, match cases as a symbol of their being one of those elite flank company men. Again, it's one of many distinctions that either kind of flank company man would have. Uh, we don't see one here, so again, another mark uh, in favor of the idea that this man may be a fusilier, not a grenadier. But moving onwards, the lack of wings is hardly the worst offense as concerns this man's coat, because heavens above, near nothing about this coat is accurate to the American War of Independence. Like I mentioned earlier, this is very much a Napoleonic-inspired style of coat. It's closed at the front with a single layer of buttons, and while it does have lacing on each side of those buttons, even if that lacing is painted over in red, whereas it should be, you know, distinctive from the coat itself, should have some sort of pattern to it. Eh, all right, small thing. Uh, no matter what, it doesn't have, the coat doesn't have any facings going down the front. Whereas during the American War of Independence, regimental coats would be very much longer and usually sit open at the front with their colored facings, uh, which would vary from regiment to regiment. For example, the 54th Regiment of Foot would have green facings, while the 10th would have yellow. Uh, the 33rd would actually have red facings, but they are still there, very distinctive, you know, so on, so forth. Blues, black even, various different colors could be used as a way to help identify, you know, different regiments on the field. Now, that older style of regimental coat can be closed, but when it's done so, it doesn't look like what this man is wearing, rather it's more of a double-breasted design, as the facings on both sides of the coat are undone and then crossed over top of each other, as you can see being worn here by my friend Chris. A soldier can wear his coat like this to keep him warmer during the winter should he desire, but it's not generally worn in that way. 
Under that coat, the man would also wear a waistcoat of wool over top his linen shirt. Usually the waistcoat is white or buff colored, although there are some exceptions to that, like light infantrymen who might wear red waistcoats. However, as the waistcoat would go over top of the breeches at the waist just a little bit, you know, it's a, it's a little longer than the, uh, the breeches themselves are, you know, as they come up, um, normally you can, you know, even if the coat is closed, see the bottom of a waistcoat poking out. We don't see that here, and so we must assume, I think, that this man is not wearing a waistcoat at all, which again would be in line with the Napoleonic style. Um, he presumably only has his linen shirt tucked, you know, into his breeches there, as again would be the case for a Napoleonic era coat, which again this design is very clearly taken from. Another good way to tell whether a coat belongs to the American War of Independence or a later time period is to look at its collar. And unfortunately for our strange little Grenadier Battalion Napoleonic hybrid soldier of the Freemasons, this man has a standing collar. During the 1770s and early 80s, British regimental coat collars would lie flat, usually featuring regimental buttons and lacing on them. It was a later development, more towards the various uniform and drill reforms made to the army in the 1790s, that we start to see coats with standing collars, and that style would carry through to the Napoleonic army as well. Oh, and uh, while we're up here looking at the collar, uh, look a little bit lower down, and it's worthy to note that this slovenly soldier seems to have also forgotten his stock. A most dire sin indeed. On parade and other formal occasions, a soldier might wear a stock of black velvet around his neck, but on campaign, it might be horsehair, or in later years, leather. It would be worn over top of his shirt collar, and that collar might sometimes poke over top of the stock and fold over it, while other other times the stock would entirely cover the shirt underneath, but either way, the stock must be worn. Changing tacks, if we want to look further down to the bottom of this coat, we can also see that the coat is a little off even for a Napoleonic style as well, because despite its being clearly Napoleonic inspired, it still has the much longer tails of the earlier, more 18th century style coats. Napoleonic era coats would still have tails, but they were very, very short. Here they're going all all the way down to the back of his knees. And that's even pretty long for a lot of coats during the American War of Independence, as a lot of them were being cut shorter as the war went on. But all the same, the longer tails are definitely more 1770s than they are 1810s. Which, to be fair, is exactly what this man ought to be. Uh, but he is otherwise wearing what is clearly a Napoleonic coat. Uh, which again, it just it throws the entire thing off. Uh, do we praise them for at least getting the tails correct? Correct to the period, even if all the rest of the coat is completely wrong? Or do we censure them for not even getting the incorrect coat correct on its own merits, even if that coat is inaccurate for the time period seeking to be portrayed? These things can get very, very complicated, of course. So, heck, maybe this was even a severely misguided attempt to portray a man wearing a sleeved waistcoat. Uh, like, like maybe the artist saw an example of sleeved waistcoats at one point in, I don't know, like, like a sketch of the Battle of Paoli or something like that, where you can see them being worn, uh, and assumed, like, oh, that's what a red coat looks like. They assumed instead that the regimental coat is the same exact style as years later, because they saw in a painting and there wasn't a lot of detail, and they just kind of, you know, went with that design. Who knows? Who knows? But still, it's worthy of note, uh, a sleeved waistcoat is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. It is a waistcoat with sleeves added onto it. Uh, in some instances, certain light infantrymen actually ditched their regimental coats entirely, just added sleeves onto the waistcoats, and wore them as much lighter, cooler uniforms, particularly for things like, you know, campaigning in more southerly climates. Uh, here you can see some men of the 40th Regiment afoot in exactly that kind of style, with no facings or tails to their, quote, their coats, quote unquote, whatsoever. It's a great look, very, very utilitarian, great aesthetic there. So again, maybe the artist saw those and thought that it was a Napoleonic style coat and just assumed it was all the same and they went with that or eh, who knows, let's move on. Uh, as far as all the other details go, there isn't all too, too much to say. Uh, it's a little difficult to tell if this man is wearing breeches or gaitered trousers, uh, so-called because the bottom of the trousers basically acted the same way as gaiters would, uh, uh, you know, being really tight around the legs, helping to protect the ankles and the feet on the march. Um, but either way, he doesn't have any buttons to speak of on top of them, whereas there should be a few at the top to, well, uh, keep them up and keep the fly up as well. Uh, so I suppose these were just uh, pulled up very, very tightly on the fellow, and uh, he, again, just needs to make sure that he isn't really moving around all too much, lest he, uh, 
lose himself a bit, so to say. Uh, now, if this man is wearing breeches and not gaitered trousers, as I believe is the case just by looking at some of the uh, texturing there around his knee, it would also mean that over top of his stockings, he is wearing full white gaiters. Whereas if this man was expecting to go on campaign, he'd be better suited to gaiters that only extend just above the ankle. Full gaiters, the kind that go above the knee, are much better for garrison duty and would generally only be seen there and on parade. Uh, the full gaiters, they look really good, uh, and yes, they do help to protect one's stockings very well, but they're also much harder to put on and take off, and they don't really serve all too, too much of a practical purpose in comparison with the shorter, cooler, and easier to wear ankle high gaiters. Again, the entire point of them is to protect the feet on the march. So whether it's full or shorter doesn't matter all too, too much in that regard. Uh, and in either instance, whether this man is on garrison duty uh, in winter quarters or on an actual campaign, whatever style of gaiters he's wearing, they ought not to be white, but black. White gaiters may be worn on parade at horse guards, but otherwise, in these later years of the 18th century, gaiters being worn on actual service would be coated in something called black ball. It's the same terribly messy stuff that men would use to blacken their shoes and other assorted accoutrements. Um, it's kind of like shoe polish, uh, except uh, the 18th century stuff is uh, far less easy to set evenly. Um, black ball would help to waterproof things, basically. Uh, it helps to protect them as well in the same way that, well, like a modern shoe polish might. Um, they would turn their gaiters black by coating it in that black ball. However, it might be said as well, perhaps, that maybe the man just isn't wearing any gaiters at all and that these are just his stockings, which would make sense given how little texturing we see at the knees here. Uh, maybe it's just showing the top of his stockings tucked into the bottom of his breeches there, which would indeed be correct. However, if this is the case, well, then it may be a sin even worse than him having the wrong gaiters. Having none at all is a very big no-no. As well, if that is the case, it would make the detail of his shoes all the more strange. Now, at first glance, it looks like he has the tongue of his gaiters, the little uh, front flap there, placed over top of his shoe buckles. Again, the gaiters are meant to protect the ankles and the shoes on the march, so that would be correct. Uh, though in that case, there ought to as well be a strap of leather going underneath the shoe to keep the gaiters on tight as well. You can't just have the things flapping all around because it would entirely defeat the purpose of preventing things getting into the shoes. Uh, but indeed, if this man isn't wearing gaiters and only stockings, well, it makes these look more like slippers than actual proper military shoes. And I think you can see the distinction there pretty clearly. And then, of course, at the end of it all, we have the man's musket. I'll make it nice and quick. If this is a British soldier, in all likelihood, he ought to be carrying a second model short land pattern uh, musket, also called the Brown Bess, which is a firearm whose barrel is kept inside its stock by a series of pins. I actually have another very old video where I fully disassemble one, if you're so inclined. Uh, and not, as we see here, by bands of metal placed around the barrel. There really aren't any other noteworthy details he'll to, here to tell what kind of musket this is, uh, but it seems possible that our British regular somehow managed to get his hands on an American-used Charleville musket or some other kind with barrel bands. And lordly heavens above, I believe that has mostly done it. Finally, and at long last, we somehow managed to get through it all. And if you've made it this far, then well, pat yourself on the back. Well done. Uh, that is a pretty strong commitment right there. I respect that. Or respect it, fear it, and maybe a little bit of both. Um, you know, when I first saw this little mug in an antique shop, uh, I thought it could be, you know, fun, quick, casual, little, eh, I'll just complain about a few things here and there, I'll be done with it. Uh... Yeah, it's not really how this sort of works, I suppose. You, um, you've come to expect this sort of thing from me. Um, you know, would that I could learn to overlook certain historical inaccuracies, maybe in lieu of a shorter, more YouTube algorithm-friendly video, but yeah, that, that's, that's not how this channel works. You know how that, that's not how it works. I, I ought to learn that's not how it works. Oh well. In any case, if nothing else, at least for now, another most egregious and abhorrent example of Farbury has once again been set to rout. 
by the um, really quite overzealous forces of historical accuracy. So three huzzays, God save the king, and this video has dramatically overstayed its welcome. All the same, I do hope this silly piece of pedantry has uh, still managed to teach you a little bit of something, um, at least a little something about the, you know, the British Army in North America that uh, maybe you didn't know about before. Uh, so, as ever, my dear viewers, thank you so very much for watching, most particularly to my ever-beneficent supporting classes on Patreon.com. For again, it is by virtue of their generous financial support that I am able to carry on with all of my work. Until the next time, my dear viewers, I am and I shall remain your most humble and obedient of servants.